last session of the day. The theme today is uh, space, um, how we occupy space, how we move into space, and uh, we're going to end up the day with the topic of mobility. Uh, what we're seeing is that the scenarios that we're seeing appearing on the market for mobility, they question our relationship to the machines. Um, and they question how we share our spaces with them. Uh, so we are going to uh, elaborate to try to understand if it's for good or for bad, will we turn in, into Terminator or something better. So uh, our two speakers, um, which I, I will present in a minute, uh, together we are going to dive into two topics, the changing relation between human beings and our interactions with space and especially vehicle. Uh, an autonomous vehicle is a kind of robot, but we are going to see everything that, uh, uh, that runs on a, on a road or, or on ground. And we are going to also to discuss uh, how business leaders can prepare, adapt their companies, and adapt themselves as positive contributors to mobility, and therefore contributors to the society. So let me introduce the two speakers. Uh, on my right, on your left, Eric, Eric Grab. Uh, he is VP Strategic Anticipation and Innovation at a company called Michelin. Uh, I'm sure you know this company. Uh, Eric, you are the Vice President of Michelin. You are in charge of strategic innovation for the whole group. Located in, uh, you are located based in Clermont-Ferrand. Uh, you are also in charge of an initiative that you will explain to us called Moving On Lab. Um, it's a co-innovation ecosystem. So it's a, a network constellation of uh, 300 companies, international companies. So there are startups, there are academics, international organizations, research lab, and uh, as well as authorities. Uh, so that's uh, an ambitious program that you have been launching. You will explain us what it is about. Gadi, Gadi Amit. Uh, you are president and principal designer of a company called New Deal Design, located in uh, San Francisco. It's, uh, so you are uh, at the head of a design department and you are behind some of the most innovative and market uh, winning products. I asked Gadi an example. You just need to know that Gadi was one of the designer uh, of the Fitbit that you all know. So a, we can say it's an award-winning uh, winning, um, product. And you are president of Technology Design Studio, New Deal Design. So you have a multidisciplinary team, talented multidisciplinary team with different culture and technology. And you will tell us how you marry all that to get uh, uh, some mobility experiences that no one has offered before. So uh, maybe Eric, we can I can leave you the floor to present, uh, you know, your 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 company and um, yeah, Eric, sorry, <laughs> your company and uh, what you're doing. Yeah, that's Gaddy. That's not me. But voilà. uh, sorry, sorry, it's my mistake. Uh, okay, it's okay. Uh, it's a Gaddy, problem of copy paste. Your turn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe we should introduce each other's presentation. Yeah, why not? <laughs> So I, I probably need the clicker, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to walk uh, quickly through some of the work uh, we've done in the last 10 years. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are a technology design studio. We are relatively small, but we try to be very nimble. Um, the motto of the uh, studio is good happens here. And we've been uh, dealing with uh, mobility for way over 10 years. Uh, here's one example, for instance, uh, Better Place about 10 years ago was a mega project to create end-to-end um, -end, uh, electric uh, vehicle charging system. Um, this was actually in, um, in conjunction with Renault Nissan and they deployed uh, quite a few of these. Unfortunately, uh, the system that was uh, planned to be rolled out all around the world uh, was just a little bit too early. Uh, it included a lot of endpoints, including an app uh, way back in 2008. 
Um, lately, uh, we've been helping a small startup called Envoy to deploy electric vehicles into commercial and residential buildings uh, as an amenity, so anyone could actually walk and uh, get a car as they need. Um, I'm going to click forward a little bit. And you could see here that a lot of what we're trying to do is uh, create an environment that is, um, I'd say, happy and uh, welcoming to uh, not only the innovation, but also the people who are going to use the innovation. Uh, it includes in many, ty uh, many types of uh, media today, including digital. Uh, there's always an app attached to it. There is uh, an art. Uh, of how to make the app not too complicated and it should be something dynamic that people feel uh, very much attracted to. Um, we also deal with forward thinking uh, about mobility. One of the big uh, mistakes in my mind about mobility is that it, most of the thinking now is dealing with urban spaces and what we've been trying to do in this uh, conceptual uh, project is to envision uh, effect of uh, aut autonomics, uh, the, uh, auto autonomous vehicle and economics outside the cities. Uh, I think that if you don't care about driving, you may be driving uh, in autonomous vehicle two hours outside the city. And then the question is, what are you going to do there? So here's one scenario, for instance, if we have autonomous vehicle that is super accurate, you could actually dock next to a bus and uh, maybe have coffee on the bus and go back to, to the car. So these are some of ideas that could come to reality if we're using uh, digital technology to, to its uh, full uh, strength. Or conversely, if you are... Um, going on a date, for instance, or taking your girlfriend to see the scenery and you forgot to bring flowers. Maybe there is a little uh, unicycle robot that could deliver flowers to your car, will dock to your car, and actually you'll be able to uh, receive things uh, in your car. So you see here the docking and uh, the date was saved. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so one of the latest things that we've done in this arena is um, helping a company called Postmates, which is one of the big players in the urban delivery uh, scene in the US, um, deploy a new type of uh, delivery robot. And we intentionally made it um, funny, if you wish, and uh, very colorful, very playful and put a lot of emphasis on interaction. So uh, the robot is uh, communicating all the time with the people around, uh, telling them uh, whether they, the robot is turning left or right, and so on and so forth. And this is somewhat of an experiment with over-design because we need to create a new language of communication between uh, robots and uh, people. And this is some examples here uh, about what the robot is going to do. I'm going to maybe cut to a slightly better video showing the latest uh, of this robot. It's actually roaming already in the San Francisco area. You see one of the first prototypes here. And you could see that it has a whole uh, illumination pattern. Uh, it has eyes. The eyes are squinting and winking and has also uh, a display that allows you to interact with it. Uh, this is an experiment, if you wish. Uh, it's an experiment in creating a new uh, interaction uh, culture between us humans and uh, things that are intelligent and moving around us. This is a situation we never had. And we need to learn it and experiment and find the right uh, mode of communication that both sides could understand each other. Um, so that's a small sample of the work we do. Um, thank you. 
Wonderful. So it looks like uh, the robots are more friendly than the ones from Terminator. I think you're going to explain us the psychology of doing um, robots that are doing good to the society later on. I will. <laughs> Eric, um, so Michelin, uh, you're wondering why Michelin is at the center of mobility. And uh, the image that I have from your company is that you are the node, the link, between the mobility device itself, the automobile, or even the robot, and the terrain. Uh, the field, the, the, the road. Field, the road. So you are at, uh, let's say, a critical, you are a critical part of this whole mobility ecosystem. So it's why I think you are extremely well placed in order to build a new type of ecosystem, because you have the upper part above the wheel and under the wheel. So, true. Tell, true. so tell us a little bit your uh, mindset and, uh, well, the story behind that. Let's try. Uh, before building an ecosystem, uh, you need to align your own company and your own department on what you want to do. So one way to describe what I'm doing is to use this slide. My job is, in fact, to avoid this. And I'm sure that if you have some managers in this audience, you will understand what I'm talking about. You know, here you have the marketing uh, cahier des charges, you have what the research is proposing, and obviously the finance is coming and saying, hey, no, guys, it's cost much too much. You have to change your mind and, and have another swing. And it's continuing in general. You have also the development, which is saying, no, 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 I want to do that because I know how to develop a product. By the way, I'm using uh, Katia to develop this product, so I know, and I have the right tools. So you cannot do mistakes. Yeah, I, you cannot do mistakes. And the production is coming and saying, hey, in my factory, we see that you've never been in the factory because in the factory, we are able to do that. And at the end of the day, in fact, the customer is willing a tire. That's what he wants, a tire. And I am always using this uh, analogy just to convey three messages. The first one is clearly experience. What, it, what matters is really the customer experience. In this case, the customer, what does he want? He doesn't want a tire, in fact. He would like to relive what the garden with the grandmother, when the grandmother was pushing him, pushing him on the swing, right? That's what he's trying to remember and uh, re find again. So it's an experience in this case. It's not a product he wants to, to, uh, to, uh, to purchase. The second message is clearly that in a company big like ours, we are a worldwide company, a big corporation, you need to have a shared vision. And it doesn't exist. It should not exist. In fact, it's always existing in big corporations. So my job is to avoid this different vision before, before building an ecosystem with other companies. Because uh, we will see that in the mobility world, from my point of view, you need other companies. And that the third message is uh, what I call latent needs. In this case, we're not talking about needs which you can capture with market research. We're not talking about asking you, sir, what do you want? You will not say that. You will say, yeah, I want a tire or I want a swing. But I will not understand exactly the, the experience you want to live. So here we are talking about latent needs, those needs that the people will not formalize, will not give you through a market research, which means you have to develop new tools. And the marketing tools are not adapted to at understand the and anticipate customer, customer experience. That's the way I like to introduce my job, instead of saying, uh, I don't know what strategic anticipation and co-innovation. Okay. All right, now, um, part of that is that, um, as I said, you know, what is at stake in the mobility world? And Gadi, if you are not agreeing, please interrupt yeah. me. But from my point of view, we are facing huge challenges. And you know them, congestion and the related economic losses. If you ask DHL, DHL will, will tell you, well, in Milano, my guys, my drivers are losing two hours per day just because of traffic jams. Loss, economic loss. We are talking about pollution and quality of air. In most of the mayors of big cities in the world, think about China, think about India, even in Europe, the main problem of these mayors are quality of air because of pollutant, because of NOx, of SOx. Think about climate change, which is another huge stake, another huge challenge we have to solve in the mobility world. 
uh, and, and the reduction of the greenhouse gas emission. Think about mobility for all, inclusive mobility, mobility for poor people, for disabled people. Think about financing infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, because in many cases, you know, having a new metro line or a tramway costs a lot, and you have to finance that. And as you have noticed, most of the cities, most of the government don't have enough money to finance the bridges, the roads, and so on. So, in other words, and I can list that, just name it, I can list uh, uh, hundreds of these big and huge issues we have to face in the mobility world. And here we are talking about the future of mobility. How can you solve that alone? How can Michelin, even if it is a big corporation, can solve that alone? How can Gadi and his company solve that alone? No way. We have to work together. Not only Gadi and I, but a lot of other companies, uh, big corporations, startup cities, public authorities, startup companies, academics, because we all have a brick, a technological brick, a service brick, which is part of the solution. And we better hurry up because the planet cannot wait, just between you and me. So that's why we have created this huge ecosystem. It's huge now, but we began with only two or three big corporations. One of them was Dassault System. Exactly. Thank you for that. Uh, now we have more than 300 companies, but this is, for example, the corporate advisory board. In other words, the governance. We have a governance because it's, we have so many topics, so many communities of interest, as we say, that we need a governance. And I'm not the only one to decide. Michelin is not the only one to decide. All these companies, and you see Dassault System on the right inside, are deciding with us uh, about the topic, uh, where we go, with which cities we are working, which type of disruptive innovation we are introducing in cities. With Gadi, we were talking about San Francisco a few minutes ago, where they are implementing and experimenting a lot of things. We are the guinea pigs. You are the <laughs> guinea pigs, and that's nice. That's nice, in a way. Not so nice. <laughs> well, okay. You have also some troubles, I, I agree. But okay, so this is the idea. That's, that's why we, we need an ecosystem, and uh, that's why we, with such an ecosystem, if we are not able, if these guys are not able to solve the big, and to tackle the big challenges I was just mentioning, who will do it? I was doing an exercise, and I will stop on this point, but I was doing an exercise adding the turnover of all these guys. And in fact, it's superior, it's above the median of you know, uh, national product uh, of uh, half of the, of the countries in the world. So if these guys are not able to do something and to find solutions, disruptive solutions, to tackle these challenges, who will do it? So that's the, the whole idea of my job. In fact, apart from being in charge of strategic anticipation and innovation for the Michelin Group, that's it. So that's my feeling. Okay, just to uh, mention the role, because you can you, you see here um, Michelin, of course, some Valeo, Safran, who are producing physical goods. You can maybe ask your question, what is the role of Dassault System? I have an answer of that. Good. Um, because when you're creating an ecosystem, in fact, you need to speak a common language. Absolutely. Uh, when you're saying, you know, in your first uh, slide, the problem is that the way uh, the idea was expressed at the beginning is uh, often with a Word document, with a PowerPoint, and we are a strong believer that the universal language to communicate is 3D. Absolutely. So why? Because 3D is not ambiguous. So when you see our compass, on the west side of the compass, there is 3D, because this is a universal language. And the beauty of 3D is what? Is that if you take a two word document and you try to merge them, it's uh, not understandable. If you try to take two pictures, pixels, and you merge them, you cannot understand them. If you take two 3D scenes and you merge them, well, this is, this is possible. Yeah. So the tree with the, uh, the rope and with the, um, how can it look new? The tire. Uh, the tire. <laughs> uh, so we strongly believe that 3D is a universal language that has a, um, that has, um, a, propriety, a, a, proprietary which, a property which is uh, miscible. Yeah. It can be uh, mixed. It's an enabler, anyway. <coughs> yeah, you are, it's so true that, in fact, to tell you the truth, I'm trying to convince you guys, Dassault System, but also to convince Microsoft and Ubisoft and Orange and all these guys to develop a kind of simulation platform 
to imagine what will be the mobility, multimodal mobility, by the way, yeah. like you showed, in the, in the future cities we, in, we will live in. Because, you know, the young generations, and we have some young guys here in the assistance, the relationship they have with cars has nothing to do with the relationship, uh, emotional relationship I had with my cars. And the way they manage their mobility through this type of tools has nothing to do with the way I was managing the mobility. So we have to simulate that. We have to anticipate that. Totally and one agree. way to do it is to, to use 3D and, and by the way, virtual, v -R, v -R. virtual reality also, because exactly. uh, uh, that's why Ubisoft is interested by our approach. It's because it's also gaming somewhere. And this new generation, they know how to play with these different solutions, yeah. mobility solutions. Sorry to be too long. Get it. No, I was actually uh, wanted to add a, an example. I had um, four or five years ago a big argument with someone who is now a head of a big division at Uber. What will be the effect on congestion? And they claim that they are removing cars from the street. And I said, this is not what I see as a driver. So if you're talking about simulation, it could have been easily solved through a simulation because I agree. what the Uber drives are doing are basically loitering. If they don't have a ride, they basically continue to circle until they get a ride. And that amounts to a major congestion. By the way, uh, one scenario we are working with these guys on, mobility scenario, yes. is that autonomous cars yeah. will increase congestion. Yes, and this Just was another because, argument. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, you, it's so funny to be in a con autonomous car tomorrow because you can do a lot of things. And that's the reason I said that probably people will want to stay outside the city. Yeah. Okay, so let's go yeah. back on track because we went out of... Yeah, we don't know <laughs> you. We don't need you. In fact, we can yeah, talk yeah, together. Okay. If you want to. Um, <laughs> thank you for being the advocate of the middle button, which yeah. is the, the play <laughs> button, because the play means you simulate 3D, you simulate Vprezar, etc. Back to, uh, back to the track, so what we learned from both of our presentations is that we cannot do business as usual. It's not business as usual. So to address the environmental challenge, challenge, we need new models, new models of working together. This is what you all expressed, both of you, and new ways to do business. What are, uh, it's a question for Eric primarily, what are the most important mind shifts that companies like yours have to make to be part of the solution? Well, if we are talking about cooperation as such, in each corporation, we s I think we should go back to customer centricity. And, and design thinking is helping that. And designers are helping for that. Because we are all saying, yeah, yeah, we know our customers, no problem. No, 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 we don't know our customers. We do what we have done since years for our customers. But customers are changing because of digital revolution, because of many reasons, congestion, new cities, and so on. These customers' are also needs are also evolving. So as far as I can, in my company, Mishnah, I'm trying to help to be each day even more customer-centric. I'd give you an example. Uh, we are, since decades, selling mileage instead of tires. We are selling takeoff and landing for airplanes instead of tires. This is a completely mi change of mindset. This is completely different. And this is helping us to be closer to our customers. Because when you sell mileage or when you sell fuel consumptions, you are obliged to understand the business model of the, of the transportation companies, for example. You are obliged to be much closer to the customer to better understand how you can help him to reduce his, its cost, for example. And in this case, you are much more customer-centric than uh, that when selling just tires. The second thing I think we should do in, in our big corporation is to empower people to take decisions. Because all big companies, have a lot of level of hierarchy, and it takes time to go through the level of hierarchy. Now, because change are changing, uh, things are changing rapidly, you need to react much quicker. But to do that, you need to empower the people on the field, close to the customers. If your key account manager is not able to take a decision and he is uh, obliged to go back to the big chief in Clermont-Ferrand downtown, then, then, then you have a problem. And uh, this is a second point. And the third point is simplification. We are too complex. If we want to be agile, we have to be simple. 
So it's, it's a permanent war in all big corporations because we are surrounded by brilliant engineers and they like complexity. They are even trained to solve complexity. So we have each time to, to develop simple processes, simple methods, uh, and you can help but I, I, as Dassault system to develop these uh, simple tools uh, to, to be used. Uh, so that's what I am trying to do uh, with a lot of other guys within my company, and I think we should all do that e even before we can work together. Uh, toward the simplicity of design, maybe I can give uh, one, one example. Um, Usually, we are, when we did create a new piece of solution, a new software, we, I'm telling the engineers to come in the office, and we work on a big screen, and uh, they show me, of course, things that are quite complex, because they're engineers, as you said, and what we do as an exercise, we try to remove things. And removing things, removing things, does it still work? Does it still um, function as it should? Is it still desirable? And this is the way we are dealing with complexity. Nice. Katia has always been, um, the feedback I got, it's a very powerful environment to create 3D uni uh, universes. But it was always, I would say, for geeks or for uh, bright engineers. What we have done since now 10 years is uh, to make this accessible to a one-man company. And this is the way we do. You know, we take this complexity away, still having the same fulfillment. So Great. it's a way to, Great. to to lower the complexity. And um, since now we are moving from a car to a complex ecosystem of, you know, an iPhone, a phone, sorry, not a phone, um, several cars, a satellite that it connects to, if you don't simplify and subdivide a complex problem into sub-problem, this, this is not working. We call this model-based system engineering, to devise, divide a complex problem into individual problems. Nice. So that was the first question. A uh, question for you, Gadi. Uh, so what we saw in your video is that design encompasses the willingness to do good. Uh, and this is what also your company stands for. Um, this was the motto that you explained us at the beginning. So in practical terms, <laughs> how do you build doing good into your business model? Uh, <laughs> it's complicated. I'll try to explain it in many, many uh, ways. First of all, we uh, focus on products and experiences that are for quote unquote real people, meaning the main uh, layer of society. We tend to uh, work less in luxury and uh, elitist uh, sphere, uh, spaces. We try to create impact to uh, the mainstream of society. Uh, if you are working there, you get a very good sense of what is real and what is not real. Uh, obviously, the second layer is understanding uh, humans and understanding real behavior of humans. If you're talking about mobility, I'll give you an example how all the software engineers today are working on cars that are autonomous without taking one of the biggest uh, components in, in driving which is locking eyes with the driver that comes next to you. You cannot drive in the city without understanding the intent of pedestrians. In order to understand the intent of pedestrians, you need to read their faces. And this is what we do a million times again a day, and no software can do today. No software could do that. And that's because a lot of the effort was placed in different area, which is taking a big chunk of steel and move it around big geometry and not real granularity. So doing good is also understanding the human nature so you could write the spec correctly and drive engineers towards the right problems. So this is a very difficult uh, level. The third level is actually a societal. Uh, humans are organized in groups in society, we have uh, structures, we have legislators, we have municipalities, and in San Francisco, we've seen how much uh, impact these uh, structures have on businesses in the mobility arena. We had uh, companies coming with new uh, 
e-scooters and they were thrown out of the streets. Uh, before we started this project of the delivery robot, there was another uh, delivery uh, robot startup that was stopped by the city because it was very ugly, big, and uh, took too much space on, uh, on the sidewalk. And the city just moved in and shut them down. So I think the tech industry has been somewhat uh, uh, really either naive or, or uh, reluctant to understand the complexity of human society. And they did their thing, as we say in California, and got hit pretty badly. And it's now clear that you need to involve uh, the societal layers in uh, design, in uh, technology development, and in business models in order to make things that could actually work in reality. Yeah. I, I would like to rebound on that because it's a fundamental point. Yeah. I mean, most of the big corporations are pushing technologies. Yeah. And uh, one reason why we spend a lot of time in our ecosystem to understand the future demand or the future needs, it's because we know that our natural behavior is to push techno, because we believe in these technologies. We, we created them, you're right? But you're right, they are not addressing the, the right demand and the right needs. So that's where design thinking is useful. That's where you need to spend a lot of time to understand in depth the demand. And you need to have the right stakeholders. Yeah. Pas uh, p pedestrians, yeah. cities, and all these stakeholders around yeah. the table. And it takes some time. And the reason why we have 80% of the startup companies worldwide, which are failing, one of the key reasons, from my point of view, is because they don't understand demand. And 80%, believe it or not, of the disruptive innovation in big corporations are also failing. We don't know it because they don't say it. But in fact, it's failing just because we don't understand the demand. So we have to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy prototyping, experimenting, to, to develop this understanding. But, but we also need to get other types of people in the room. True. I think there is a crisis now. It's, it's a little bit of a segue. I don't want to go too much into it, but I think there's a crisis in the business world that, uh, around technology where people from humanities, people with uh, social science and so on, are not part of the discussion. And because of that, the tech world now is under a lot of pressure. They made some big mistakes, whether it's Facebook on one end, or we just talked about mobility and so on. It's because the type, the right type of people is not in the room. If you are just talking between geeks about software or hardware, you got a problem. It's true. I mean, go to Las Vegas to the CES, yeah. you see a lot of stupid technologies. Yeah. Just because they were not thought yeah. with, the, with the people needs. All right. Um, so th <laughs> it's very difficult to moderate such a. Uh, we so can help is, you if you want. <laughs> so, this is about doing good. Um, so, let's speak about uh, eco mobility. Um, so, how, it's for you, Eric, mainly. Uh, how are companies like Michelin approaching eco mobility of the future? Uh, what are the challenges that you face understanding this eco-mobility? And um, if you would like to share some maybe lessons learned with uh, the, the room um, and um, understand how you should act as business leaders in the mobility sector. What, what is needed? Well, eco-mobility is really the key topic for the future. I mean, we, we cannot... The mobility we have today is not sustainable. We all know that. So we have to change. And again, to change, we have to be disruptive. We have to go back to the demand. We have to go back to under understand the needs, consumer needs, citizen needs, and so on. Now, talking about Michelin, because it's your question, uh, we have been uh, eco-mobile since the beginning. When we were doing you know, uh, tires with more mileage, we were eco-friendly. When we are now selling to Tesla, I have seen somebody from Tesla in the room, uh, we are selling tires with a low rolling resistance, which means the, they don't heat so much. In other words, they don't consume energy, which means it's good because then uh, if you have an electrical car, your autonomy, battery autonomy is, is higher. When we do this type of things since decades, we are eco-mobile. Now we do even more today. 
and the war is also going through circular economy. As you know, if you want to implement a circular economy process system, you need three things, more or less. An eco-conception, and that's where, again, we need designers. Eco-conception conception from the beginning. You have to, at the beginning, when you, when you develop a tire on the Katia system, for example, you have to think about the material you will use so that you can reuse them. It's not easy at all, because I don't know if you know, but in your tires, well, by the way, how many components do you think we put in a normal tire? How many components, different components? Any idea? Chemically. Yeah. Oh. Probably 50. It's 200, more or less, in average. So you have in your tires, on your car, 200 different components. And we do our best to integrate them. Now, the problem is, when you recycle them, you need to go back to the raw materials. And it's not, it's not easy, because we do our best to, to integrate them. So uh, circular economy, for me, is a co-conception from the start. And I, I motivate you, I try to, uh, to advise you to go on our website to see the vision concept, a vision concept, which is a, a tire which is done only based on natural materials. It's a concept for the moment. We are unable to produce it for the moment. We are looking at, for, on it, but it's possible to produce. A, it costs a lot for the moment, but too much, but a, a tire only with, raw mat with a natural material. So that's one way. The second pillar of the uh, circular economy is clearly, nowadays, Internet of Things. Why? Because if you're able to predict when the tire has a problem, what we call predictive maintenance, then you increase the entire life, which is also eco-friendly. And third, and last but not least, you need to develop product service system. In other words, not anymore selling tires, but selling mileage, for example. When you do that, we are the owner of the tires. You can use the tires. I'm talking about B2B. In the B2C, it's much more complex, but in B2B, for big transportation companies, developing a product service system is great for the environment because we are the best one to care about our tires. We know them by heart. We know, them how, we know how to use the last drop of rubber, and that's what we are doing. So that's the way we understand what you call uh, eco-mobility. Just that everyone understands when you say you're not selling tires, but uh, mileage? Yeah, price per kilometer. That's what we are doing with, uh, more and more with big transportation companies. If they drive their car, they pay. If they don't drive their car, or they truck, in this case, they truck, they don't pay. So we, we have a cost per mileage, per mile, or per, per kilometer. That's the idea. That's what we call functionality economy. It's, or the North American guy are calling that product service system. You're moving from a product economy to, um, let's say, a service or an experience economy. Yeah, the more you experience your tire, the more you pay. Yes, exactly. Okay. So this is uh, at least one hint to think differently in the design of the mobility and eco-mobility. Back to Gadi. Um, you work a lot in the domain of the future of mobility, and we cannot talk about the future of mobility without uh, robotics, autonomous vehicles. Um, and of course, they will influence both the cultural way to see a car, but also the economic environment and our urban spaces. So what are your insights on the topic, uh, um, on this um, robotics and autonom autonomous you know, uh, driving? Yeah, I, I tend to call these uh, autonomous things because we're going to have many of them. You have uh, big trucks, so we'll have little things that uh, run around the house and uh, serve us coffee. Um, it's a very complex uh, new ecosystem, but I want to speak of one thing, which is communication. Um, currently, if you will drive an autonomous car and a policeman will say that. There's no autonomous car today that will understand that. Gestures and communication in uh, 
seamless manner is something that is, to me, very interesting to develop between uh, humans and those autonomous things. It's your either personal robot or, again, uh, a garbage truck that runs around the street. And therefore, it's very important for us that we'll have a common language, not uh, per platform. We cannot afford that Amazon will have their language and Apple will have their language and Google will have yet another one and then the European countries decide, oh, all these Americans are speaking their language. We must have our own European language. So we cannot do that. We need a, a common language. And I think it's a very complicated uh, topic to start uh, working on. As I mentioned earlier with this uh, Postmate robot, we are starting to de develop uh, hints. It could be illumination or a wink on the eye or something like that. And we we'll probably need to increase the level of experimentation because if we, as we put things like that out in the street, they're not only testing uh, the reaction, they're also um, cultivating the society around to a, a new mode of interactions. When you send something uh, out there to the field, you're basically changing the field and affect it. So to me, that's a, a huge design problem that will probably will take us a few decades, honestly, to develop. And my uh, job today is actually starting to talk about it. Because so far, it's not been discussed at all. And so far, it's not been referred to as a major problem. And what we are trying to do is to elevate the discussion so there's going to be more and more interaction around those type of problems. Gadi is talking about the interface between human beings and autonomous cars. But and autonomous things. That they, and autonomous general. things, yeah. vehicles. Yeah. We should also talk about the interface between autonomous vehicle and non-autonomous vehicle, yeah. which, which will be the long period of time where we live. Yeah. And, and the non-autonomous non-autonomous have usually humans in them. Yeah, yeah. but precisely, <laughs> it won't be so easy. We, we we have done an experimentation with Google some times ago, yeah. uh, where in fact all the guys who were driving, yeah. they knew that the autonomous car will stop anyway yeah. because of the sensors. Yeah. So they were you know taking the priority and and yeah. going on. Yeah. So it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this insight on on autonomous vehicles. Um, a question to Eric to follow the track. Um, we are going to speak about design. <laughs> um, so at Michelin, how are you leveraging design in your business to move forward? Is it an important topic? How do you incorporate design and at which stages of the company? Uh, do you think there is a corporate culture education to be done on design? How is design perceived inside Michelin to address eco, eco um, eco-mobility, mobility of the future? I will try to be short, but uh, as much as possible, we are trying to, uh, to, to make our top management work on design thinking sessions to better understand the usage cases. And you know, when you speak about customer centricity, it has to begin with the CEO. So they have to understand that what is, the, what is at stake for, the, for our customers, uh, what are their pains? And, and uh, we are making, for example, we, we, we are organizing internal learning expedition to show the top management what are the problems of customers to purchase a tire, or what are the problems of a customer if they want to change a wheel, as we discussed a few minutes ago. Um, we also dedicate some time of the executive committee for disruptive innovation. Because it's difficult when you are a member of, a disrupti uh, of a, an executive committee to focus more than one hour on a disrupt disruption. So in this case, we have days. Five times a year, we have days where we are only focusing on disruptive innovation. So this type of things, practical ones, simple ones, are helping us to convey those uh, messages on customer centricity, the role of design, the importance of design. I love it. It's um, educating the CEOs, right? CEOs and, and the C-level, yeah. because uh, the C-levels 
my CEO is here. No, no. no I <laughs> We changed. Our CEO left and he's going to, to manage uh, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi. So, no, no, but the sea levels, the sea levels have also to be, uh, to be educated. educated. All right, uh, Gadi, the last question for you. Um, you have worked on in user cent centered and, and um, interaction design. What have you learned about using design to make robots for everyone, uh, robots that everyone will love? Well, it's a very very, very complicated question. Uh, so first of all, we took a different path as uh, you just seen on uh, Postmates. We decided that this one is going to be colorful. People are reacting to colors and we created a, a scheme where the robot is going to be uh, using local graphics that is going to be com uh, commissioned by a local artist and it will be a localized strategy. So one of the things that we are implementing is personalization. Uh, ro robots will have personality, will have a name, will have uh, an area that they belong to. Uh, that's something very important. Uh, the other element is, uh, unlike other uh, design areas, we cannot ask people how they feel because nobody really has experience working with uh, robots. So we need to employ a lot of our knowledgeable guesses and intuitions and play. When I say play, I mean that sometimes we need to tweak the design as we deploy it and be able to build the design so it's very quick uh, to change, very easy to change. So that's another element to, to look into. I mentioned the uh, uh, interaction uh, layer. And finally, uh, there is something that is uh, very much built into our mind as uh, primates. We like to uh, project a personality on objects that have eyes and have some uh, morphology that looks like uh, uh, animals. And we think it's a positive thing at the beginning. So people could actually focus your atten uh, their attention into something that they think is the face. That's uh, rather than looking into a black box and don't know exactly where it's going and so on. So understanding morphology from nature is also something that we are uh, employing. I think it's a good, um, good um, metaphor. Uh, final question to you, Eric. Um, if you would have to give uh, advices to companies who want to stay ahead, in uh, mobility, uh, in eco-mobility, what action should be taken by the business leaders to stay relevant in this domain? You, you, you have run that now for several years, so I think maybe for the audience you could have some advices how to tackle that. Well, I could show you something I have in, in the slides I, I, I took with me, uh, if we can show that. Not this one, but uh, the next one. Yeah, well, we worked with academics to uh, understand what are the innovation waves uh, which we lived in the company since the 1950. And uh, if you look at what has been done, and, and this is cumulative, as you understand, we have done a lot. And to, uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about uh, uh, frugal innovation, in fact, and, and you were saying, hey, we can be much more frugal than we thought. And uh, that's more or less the idea of reverse innovation. We learned a lot in India, for example, uh, on how to produce uh, uh, less expensive tires, for example. Uh, now we are entering this new phase, which is innovation in ecosystem. This morning, I, or this, at the beginning of the afternoon, I was uh, listening to other panels, and they were saying, oh, ecosystem, uh, we all have, uh, have worked in ecosystem. We know what it is, no problem. It's, it's the past. No, 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 no. We don't know how to innovate in ecosystem. Why? Because we have different innovation cultures. If you, took, if you take you know, those stakeholders, we were talking with Gadi, like uh, cities, startups, big corporation, citizen, they don't have the same innovation culture. They don't have the same processes, innovation processes. They don't have the same innovation method, innovation tools, and they don't even have the same, the same time horizons. So to make these guys work together, it's a nightmare, I can tell you. I'm still trying. 
No, we are, we are successful sometimes, but you need to develop specific tools for that. So an advice, well, join us, learn with us, continue to learn with us, and, and, and we will make it, because it's not obvious to share. Just take an example, for, again, for, for not being too long, sharing value, the value chair. Porter, an academic, said in the 80s, shared value. He developed the concept of shared value. I mean, we are still today in big troubles when we want to share value between big corporations, for example. It's not easy at all, you know? So we are developing tools, what we call the commons, the shared intellectual property, to, to be able to do that. So on, my advice would be uh, learn more about how to innovate with your partners uh, and uh, with other companies. Not those guys you are working with the whole day long. No, no, no. Innovation in ecosystem is not in a large company. Innovation in ecosystem is working with guys you never worked with. That's different. Because you need to work with other guys if you want to solve these big issues I was mentioning a few minutes ago. So I think uh, uh, as a wrap-up, I would like to take a metaphor uh, how to keep pace with mobility. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take you through the compass up there. Yeah, why not? And to explain you... Um, how it works, what was the intent between all that. First, we said we need to be collaborative. We need to have a universal language. And I think, you know, uh, one of the universal language we all know about is 3D, is real life. So that's the West Quadrant of the Compass. Then we said we need to um, do trade-off, simulate what will happen if I put a fleet of autonomous vehicles in a city. And I want to understand what will happen. This is V plus R. It means I want to virtually simulate before I simulate in the real world. Then you just said we need to do this um, as a social innovation. Yeah. And when you look at little guy on the, on the top of the quadrant, for this people. is the symbol yeah. for social application yeah. that with a platform allows you to collaborate, to share, to connect the dots. And finally, you need to take the input, the big data that your customers your users at the end of the experience are going to, uh, when, they, when they take it onto the, uh, the robot, for example, uh, Postmaster, uh, post, uh, Postmates. Postmate robot, it accumulates a lot of data. Yeah. So in order to make it better, you need to have a system that collects all this information intelligence. You know, on the east side, it's written II, information intelligence. And I realize so, I should work for Dassault system. Voila. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's, um, I found this conclusion during all our speech, so yeah. mobility, eco-mobility, doing good, is also a matter so of collaborating, social collaboration, speaking the same language and listening to your customers. And this is all what the platform is about. And at the end, we can hit the play button and enjoy, um, how you say, doing good, you know, doing good f uh, experiences. Uh, this is the conclusion. <laughs> This is a conclusion. If anyone has questions or want to come on stage, interfere with us, you're welcome. So see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.